In the late 19th century, East Asia, a land conflicted between modernization and tradition, would see the unprecedented transformation of many nations. The Kingdom of Korea, last isolationist state of Asia, nicknamed the Hermit Kingdom by Western observers, would become the theatre of the most groundbreaking conflict between two Asian countries up to then. It would lead to one empire's rise and another's fall. This is a story of the First Sino-Japanese War. For many centuries, the Kingdom of Korea, under the leadership of the Joseon dynasty, enjoyed external peace with only sporadic peasant uprisings. As a tributary state to the great Qing dynasty, it had the superpower's protection, allowing its culture to thrive. However, after the Western powers entered the picture, the political status quo would irreversibly change. In the mid-19th century, as the powerful modernized Western nations boomed, their interest in exotic Asia spiked. After focusing on China first, they turned their attention to the Joseon Kingdom of Korea. In response, the country under the regency of Yi Hang, the father of a child King Gojong, closed its doors to the outside world through isolationist policies. The Western nickname of Hermit Kingdom would later appear to designate the nation. However, in 1873, as his son King Gojong came of age, the ambitious monarch sought to open up and modernize his state, seeking examples to follow. On the other side of the sea, the newly founded Empire of Japan was slowly emerging. Isolated itself for many centuries, Japan was forcibly opened by the United States in 1854, and soon afterwards, Western influence grew in the feudal country. To take back control, Japan had no choice but to modernize, embracing technology and Western-style administration. As a symbol of a new era, the young Emperor Meiji was brought back into formal power, overruling the Shogun. With the help of his officials, Japan was transformed from a feudal society into an industrial nation and emerging world power. The Imperial Japanese Army and Navy were greatly modernized and expanded, and further advised by the French and British. They soon became the most technologically advanced in Asia. Modernity was however not the only principle the Empire of Japan learned from the West, as it soon developed a sense of imperialism, wishing to expand its influence. The first neighbor to fall was the Ryukyu Kingdom, a tributary state of China, which integrated Japan in 1872. This event raised many questions at the Chinese imperial court, but most officials dismissed it, confident in the Qing dynasty's might. After this success, Japan soon turned its size to Korea. In the Hermit Kingdom, Japan was an example to follow according to Korean reformists. King Gojong slowly began to establish formal diplomatic relations with the Empire of Japan. The reformist officials at the kingdom's court were nonetheless a minority, and most Koreans remained suspicious of Japan, which had in the past invaded Korea. An incident would irreversibly change the course of events. When a patrolling Japanese gunboat was attacked by Korean coastal defences in 1875, the Empire of the Rising Sun seized the occasion to force an unequal treaty between the two nations, greatly expanding its influence over its neighbour, gaining privileges in trade and extraterritorial rights. In addition, Gojong accepted the reformist official's request to employ a Japanese military attaché to train some Korean soldiers in a modern way. This new force was named Pyolgigun, or Special Skills Force. Consequently, his father, the retired isolationist regent Yi Haung, denounced the reformists while claiming the importance of conservative values. Furthermore, the traditional army, neglected by King Gojong in favour of the new modernized force, rebelled in 1882. They stormed the Japanese legations in Seoul and assassinated the Japanese military advisor. However, most members of the Japanese delegation successfully escaped. The following day, the traditionalist rebelling army attacked the Korean royal palace and restored Regent Yi Haung to power. These events did not sit well with the Empire of Japan, which immediately dispatched forces. It however also attracted the Qing dynasty's attention to Korea. The Chinese intervened first, sending forces to quell the uprising. They captured Yi Haung, since he was both a threat to the Qing dynasty's own sovereignty over Korea, 
and a provocation to the powerful Japanese, inciting them to attack the region, and placed him under house arrest in China. Shortly after, the Qing dynasty restored King Guozhong to the throne and formally reasserted Chinese authority over the kingdom. Guozhong's actual power was very limited by the Qing dynasty, whose troops were now permanently stationed in Seoul, under General Yuan Shikai, who acted as representative of the Qing court in Korea, and soon took over the training of the Korean force. Japan would however not give up its influence over Korea so easily. Although the incident was seemingly settled, trouble would soon shake the Korean peninsula again. In 1884, Japanese-backed Korean reformists attempted a coup to purge the court from conservative and pro-Chinese officials. The short conflict however failed due to the intervention of Yuan Shikai's Qing forces who crushed the reformist rebels. During these events, the Japanese legation in Seoul was burned down and a few dozen Japanese soldiers supporting the coup were killed by Yuan Shikai's men. As a result, the outraged empire of the rising sun immediately dispatched seven warships overseas in a show of force. The situation was tense, but thanks to sensible Qing and Japanese officials Li Hongzhang and Ito Hirobumi, the conflict was settled with the 1885 Convention of Tianjin. It stated that the Qing dynasty and the Empire of Japan would withdraw their troops from Korea and never send forces again without informing the other nation first. An incident would nonetheless revive hostilities just a year afterwards. The Beiyang Fleet, China's own modernized naval force, which included two ironclads, the Zhenyuan and the Dingyuan, docked at the Japanese port of Nagasaki during a tour of Asian harbors. After a trip to the city's red light district, Qing sailors sparked a riot with locals that ended with dozens of casualties and a diplomatic crisis. Confident in its traditional domination of all of East Asia, the Qing dynasty refused to apologize for the incident. As a result, anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese sentiment rose in Japan and China respectively. Tensions between both empires were at an all-time high, and the situation would not improve. In 1894, the Kingdom of Korea suffered a massive peasant uprising, the Donghak Rebellion. The insurgents, organized in massive militias, aimed to overthrow the Korean government. In panic, Korean authorities asked for their Chinese overlord's forces to intervene. On the 6th of June, the Qing authorities subsequently embarked about 3,000 men under General Ye Zhechao, a veteran of the Taiping and Yan rebellions. They crossed the Yellow Sea from Tianjin to Asan Harbor on the Korean peninsula. Upon learning of this, the outraged Japanese government claimed this action violated the 1885 Tianjin Convention. Indeed, it stipulated that China or Japan had to inform the other nation about any movement of troops in Korea first. Subsequently, the Empire of Japan decided to send warships and landed about 5,000 men on the General Oshima Yoshimasa in Chimulpo on the 8th of June 1894. The Japanese claimed they only wanted to protect their interests in the country. Three days later, the Donghak Rebellion had been temporarily pacified, but the troops of the two empires were still in the area. Tensions rose more and more, worrying the other world powers. An attempted British mediation of the conflict turned out unsuccessful, and it soon became clear the two empires were ready to fight. On the 19th of July 1894, the Japanese Navy formed the combined fleet composed of most of its Imperial Japanese Navy warships which would exist until 1945. Just four days later, an event would mark a point of no return, as the Japanese forces in Korea marched on Seoul, deposed King Gojong, and overthrew the Korean government, replacing it with pro-Japanese officials. The puppet government then gave permission to the Japanese troops to expel Qing forces in the country by force. Yejia Charles' 3,000 men were still stationed in Asan Harbor, with a couple of warships and expectant reinforcements. Taking the initiative, the Japanese combined fleet dispatched three of its cruisers to set up a naval blockade of the area. Two days later, the first open military conflict would take place, as the naval battle of Pungdo broke out. The Chinese forces only consisted of one cruiser and a gunboat, facing the three Japanese cruisers. 
Following an hour of fighting, the Chinese cruiser was shipwrecked and exploded, while the gunboat escaped. During the conflict, the privately owned British ship Kaohsiung, transporting 1,100 elite Chinese reinforcements to Asan, was strategically sunk by the Japanese. Most of the Western crew and transported Chinese soldiers drowned, and only a few of them were rescued by other Western ships in the area. The Battle of Pungdo had been a decisive Japanese victory. Yi Zhechao's forces in and around Asan were now isolated on the Korean peninsula and within reach of the Japanese land troops in Seoul. General Oshima simply marched down and attacked this easy target. On the 27th of July 1894, after a battle that lasted all night, the Chinese soldiers were decisively defeated, counting 500 casualties, and escaped to the southwest. In their flight, they abandoned precious arms and equipment to the Japanese, who reportedly only suffered 88 casualties. This battle was a turning point. From there on, there could be no de-escalation of the situation. Emperor Guangxu of China and Emperor Meiji of Japan both officially declared war on the other nation. The First Sino-Japanese War had formally begun. Although the Chinese detachment had been defeated, its survivors rallied and found their way to the remaining Chinese stronghold in Korea, Pyongyang. The Qing dynasty still had about 13,000 troops stationed in Pyongyang, who understood that Japanese attention would soon shift this way. In the following weeks, they considerably developed the city's defences. The immediate objective of the Imperial Japanese Army was to crush all Chinese forces in Korea before the conflict could drag on into winter. Thousands of Imperial Japanese Army soldiers were subsequently sent from the mainland to the Korean peninsula as reinforcements. The bulk of the Japanese forces, now led by General Yamagata Aritomo, marched over 160 kilometers north, reinforced on the way with additional disembarked troops. They finally arrived at Pyongyang on the 15th of August. Preparing for a staunch defense, Qing General Zhuo Baogui, a Hui Muslim, performed the Islamic ritual purification before the fighting could begin. As the Japanese arrived, heavy rain began to fall upon the region. The first column of Japanese forces marched towards the city under fire, as the downpour turned the battlefield into a muddy mixture of blood and corpses. The first Japanese attack was successfully repelled, which led the Qing to believe they had won the battle. However, after having secured hill fortresses around the city, their opponents deployed their artillery, which proceeded to relentlessly bombard Pyongyang. Eventually, the Qing forces had no choice but to surrender. During the cannonade, the Qing suffered about 2,000 killed and 4,000 wounded, including the death of Hui Muslim General Zhuo Baogui, which was more than 10 times what the Japanese had suffered. The Chinese survivors, who escaped the city during the night, retreated towards the Yalu River, where they planned to establish the new line of defense. After having established order in Pyongyang, the Imperial Japanese Army followed. Within a few more days, all of the Korean Peninsula was effectively under the control of the Empire of the Rising Sun thus fulfilling an ancient Japanese desire. In the meantime, the Qing authorities had not remained idle. It was time for them to deploy their secret weapon, the modernized Beiyang fleet. A huge part of China's modernization efforts had gone into this fleet, which counted many modern steam war vessels, including the two ironclads, the Zhenyuan, its flagship, and the Dingyuan. The Beiyang fleet was under the command of Admiral Ding Ruchang, a seasoned officer, who had originally been a rebel soldier of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, but later changed allegiance and swore loyalty to the Qing dynasty. He was a veteran of the Nian Rebellion and of the Imo Incident, where he and his men had captured King Gojong's father, Yi Haong. Before news of the Qing dynasty's defeat at Pyongyang, Ding Ruchang had mustered about 6,500 men to be dispatched as reinforcements to Korea. However, as the Chinese imperial court discovered the disastrous turn of events, Emperor Guangxu and his officials were shocked. Ding Ruchang nonetheless kept his composure and accurately guessed that the retreating Qing land forces had established a new line of defense along the Yalu River. He subsequently sent the reinforcements there, which landed on the 16th of September. Korea had fallen, but the Qing dynasty was determined as ever. The Yellow Sea soon became of prime strategic importance in the conflict. 
Securing it was now the main objective of the Japanese combined fleet, led by Admiral Itosuke Uki. The naval commander was a friendly acquaintance of his opponent, Admiral Ding Chang, as they had reportedly met twice and kept in touch prior to the war. However, for both men, duty was above personal feelings. The combined fleet began searching the water for its opponent, the Beiyang fleet, during several days. Finally, one morning both navies met at the mouth of the Yalu River, where the Beiyang fleet had just disembarked the 6500 reinforcements on land. The Beiyang fleet was on paper superior to the Japanese combined fleet, counting two ironclads, and was further assisted by foreign advisors on board. The Japanese were however absolutely determined to defeat the traditional superpower of East Asia. The greatest naval battle between two rapidly modernized empires was about to take place. Its outcome would be decisive for the war. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Part 2 will be available shortly. If you have any questions or requests, feel free to leave them in the comment section below.